for that. Anyone in the audience, any questions for either the group or a single uh, member of our panel here? Hi, your first way. Mm -hmm. A question for George, actually. Um, you, you just mentioned that um, the largest contract will still stay in the inefficient process, they still stay in manual. Um, can you define the value in terms of, you said that 80% of the problems are from the smaller plants, but in terms of actual business value, uh, what percentage of the larger contracts form into the business? In which case, what percentage of the business will stay inefficient as opposed to automated and efficient? Mm -hmm. Is this? Okay, yeah. Um, I, I guess let me perhaps uh, retreat a little bit on some of those comments. I, I didn't mean to imply that 80% uh, of the business is, uh, is large contracts. Uh, I think what I was saying was that, that what we should seek to do with rights expression languages is solve uh, or come up with a, a, a means to uh, solve 80% of the licensing issues that will be addressed in that kind of a, a model. Um, in terms of what portion of AP's business is currently handled by what I referred to as the inefficient process. Um, uh, that's probably also not a very good or politic name to use for it. <coughs> um, right now it's uh, almost all of our business. I mean the, the variables there really are whether or not it goes to uh, the legal department. Um, uh, AP, like many other news organizations, utilizes uh, standardized contracts. So for small uh, entities that don't necessarily want to have any sort of customized process, we simply go through, it, it sort of stops with the salespeople, <clears throat> um, which is still inefficient. So I guess right now, 100% of AP's business is, is that inefficient model in some respect. How much revenue could be generated from smaller entities? Uh, it's really hard to know. Uh, we've had... Um, many years ago, I was involved and, and handled AP's uh, litigation for enforcement issues. Uh, and um, often you would talk to people who had taken AP content who wanted to pay for it and said, okay, point me to your salespeople. And you'd point them to the salespeople and the salespeople would say, well, you know, that, that contract's going to generate $100 a month. It's, it's too small for us to bother with. Um, and so there was no there was no outlet for these people who actually did want to to license the content, but we just couldn't. We were the processes that we had in place just couldn't handle it. How big is that market? I, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer. I don't I don't get into market size, <laughs> um, but I'm sure there are people who would have a much better understanding of that. Um, some people here may, in fact. Um, but uh, you know, I, I do think that there is a substantial um, need to be addressed there. Uh, and it's partially important to address it simply because maintaining the licensing models, which I think was mentioned uh, earlier in one of the earlier talks, is an important aspect of ensuring that um, the way that we protect our content and that our ability to generate and monetize that content uh, persists. I mean, I think that it's, um, well, uh, partially uh, that's going to be addressed later on today. Uh, I, I'm working with Thomas Hoffner on a, a panel later on this today that will address part of this. It, that is, that is a, a real concern. Um, and there are ways to handle uh, the varying approaches to rights understanding in various territories. I think, in general, what you would want, um, you know, the, the way that rights are structured, a US, most U.S. organizations are going to have the same understanding of what a, the copyright right to distribute means. Um, at least, you know, in the United States, organizations in Britain will have a similar understanding of the appropriate terms for, under U.K. copyright law. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, that I'm not 
sure is necessarily a, as big of an issue as it may seem. Um, in addition, there's also, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about later, uh, there are international um, treaties on copyright law that allow sort of a base level of understanding, but we'll get into uh, Your question's going to be answered later today. I, I had an interest. One of the questions that for me came up during uh, the various talks, listening to um, you know, your various uh, presentations, so the example that uh, Jeroen gave at the very beginning of uh, dealing with you know, an individual picture and the rights and restrictions imposed by the owner of the flower, um, and then also the owner of the copyright in the picture of the flower, um, in combination with uh, some of the very, very similar, just much bigger issues that uh, Andrew talked about later. In both cases, even before a photo was taken, somebody had already some form of interest, some form of rights. They wanted that secured and passed off throughout the further process. Both of you having listened to one another, do you think there is somewhere a common ground where we can find ways to actually at least try to solve both? The, the uh, um, standardization and uh, uh, the, uh, um, the legislation around plant rights is, is, is such a different, uh, a separate um, aspect. I think uh, we, we just briefly touched on, on or you, I think you did, on, on sponsoring and uh, uh, commercial benefits coming from images. I think that that, that in itself is, is an interesting topic and that may touch it in a way, um, which I think would be an interesting area at least to, to, to have a look at. Uh, thank you. Um, the one, one other area that um, I think where, where there is some um, s some common ground is, um, and not being facetious here, but most of the events that I deal with uh, concern sport played on played on grass. Um, and I bet in your archive um, you have um, m many hundreds of photographs of different blades of grass. Um, the, the serious point is that for a sport organisation, um, certainly those in the uh, in the hawk uh, end of the of the scale, believe that everything that exists within an arena, or everything that is associated with their proprietary rights, um, is owned by them. So um, currently there are um, very vigorous campaigns being run by uh, sports organisations in the, uh, the European Commission to achieve recognition for what they call sport IP. Once granted, and there are different motivations, um, many of them legitimate around the, sort of the gambling um, area, but once granted, that provides the trump card to sports organisations to... Um, assume a higher moral and legal um, basis for denuding um, copyright ownership. Um, so um, you're right to, to describe the, the, the many aspects of, of interest that exist um, in, that, in that flow, and clearly for me it starts much earlier than the first kick of the ball. Um, it starts with the, often with the building of the stadium, and where the public funds have gone into the building of that stadium, that, for, that therefore um, results in a, in a slightly different uh, argument. Um, but uh, go back to my original point, I think there are some parallels. Perhaps Coffee will, will um, flush out some, some more of those. Thank you. Another, please. Yes, I have a question on uh, persistent identifiers versus expressing rights. Eugene, in, in your presentation, you put the emphasis on just attaching identifiers to content rather than expressing rights. So why is that? Is that because once the identifier is, is there, you, you know, there's a recourse ex post to go back to the people who have used the content? Is it because you feel that expressing rights would be too complicated? Well, in the, in the photo space, it just seems that it's so easy for the descriptive uh, metadata to be separated from the image file and beyond that the, the metadata that exists in uh, most of the, the schema that I've seen does not do an adequate, an adequate job 
of describing the actual terms of the license or provide any information regarding the licensing history. So if you can attach a persistent identifier to the image file and then have a database that has the not only the, the rights holder, uh, the uh, licensing history, uh, and is something that's uh, updatable as that image relationship moves, uh, seems to me to be a much more effective way of uh, expressing that information to the marketplace and much more robust in what it provides. Does that, yeah, good. I would like to, to add to that um, because earlier on one of the things um, I, I detected was this precise difference. You argued very early on for you know, one broad world solution because it must be able to expand the globe because everything is so interconnected today. And um, a little later, uh, George said, well, in terms of rights expression language, um, let's not try to build one that does it all. Um, I know that you were not talking specifically about rights expression languages, and maybe the combination of uh, a rights expression language and a database uh, of rights um, is actually ultimately the right way to go. But um, how do you both think those two fit together or not? Well, again, you know, my, my, as a photographer's advocate and where, where I look around from, from the U.S. market, or, which is really not a U.S. market any longer, which is the world market, uh, I mean, it, it seems to me that, again, whatever solutions we come up to must cross borders, and whether that's through federating ID systems, or at least having... If there are different ID systems, then they absolutely have to be able to communicate with each other and be understood by each other. Uh, whether or not there could ever be one system or not, uh, I guess I have my doubts. But uh, they certainly need to be federated in the sense that uh, one understands the other and uh, that it... That it uh, moves across all borders because, I mean, my photographers sit uh, in the United States and they are uh, uh, infringed by entities around the world and they are also approached by entities around the world for the uh, licensable use of their images. So we need to have a system that uh, covers those circumstances. Yeah, I, I, I guess I don't see any real tension between what we were talking about because I think the idea of a persistent identifier for content is uh, is simply one way in which you could attach rights to content. You can either obviously build those rights directly into the metadata or simply have a an identifier that then references a database. I think what I was trying to say was not that you shouldn't build a, a robust system but that um, uh, that we should understand that at an initial level, if you try to tackle all the huge palette of, of rights and ways in which those rights can be expressed and ways in which content can be monetized, I think it, it's too big of a hill to climb initially. I think you will get there eventually, but I, I would just advocate not starting there. Thank you. You had a question? Yes. I have a question for the panel. So uh, we are talking about uh, the uh, machine readable rights, and for example, if there is such a tool to manage all the licensing process, as the one that George mentioned in your uh, talk about uh, rights expression language, those items listed there, you can manage by a tool. As a right holder or right producer, are you willing to pay for it? And if you are. How much percentage you are willing to pay for the two or service? Let me briefly repeat that question. Um, I know some folks in the in the back couldn't couldn't quite hear it. So the question was, um, if uh, we want to have a tool that helps us apply these these types of rights or these types of expressions uh, of, of constraints or, or um, things that are allowed to do with uh, content, 
um, are we willing to pay for a tool like that and uh, potentially how much? Well, I'll jump in. <laughs> we'll, we'll work our way down the line. Uh, somebody's got to pay for it, somebody's right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess I would not uh, be averse to a system where, uh, in fact, uh, the rights holder, or in my case, predominantly photographers, uh, paid some fee again, whether it's on a... Uh, per image basis or whether it's by a subscription basis, paying an annual fee to participate uh, in something. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we've, we've talked to the U.S. Copyright Office about coming up with annual subscription fees for copyright registration for photographers rather than paying $35 every time they want to upload. Uh, again, I, I wouldn't be averse to that. The actual dollar point, though, uh, I don't know, you know, hopefully there would be significant numbers of participants that would allow uh, the price point uh, to stay fairly low. Uh, obviously, if it becomes uh, burdensome to uh, individual practitioners in particular to participate, they won't participate. It's just, it's just too expensive. Um, so that's the best I can, I can offer. I think if there if there would be um, uh, a well-oiled system uh, with by which we can um, uh, offer images to that group of users of images that we aren't we we're not actually seeing that they 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 they're interested or taking those images illegally uh, um, uh, copying them from the internet we can actually monetize that I'd be uh, quite willing to go uh, um, a, a fair way. I mean, we could uh, start actively pushing that as a marketing tool, um, and I'd be willing to go for somewhere from 10 to 25 percent, if, um, yeah, yeah. I, I almost feel like I should pass, because I'm, I'm the lawyer and I don't deal with money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but just just as a, uh, the, the organization that I mentioned during my talk, uh, uh, which was something the AP started called News, uh, it was originally called the AP News Registry, it was then spun off as a separate organization called NewsRight, um, was the, the, the original model for that was that uh, to join it was actually would cost nothing, but that the, um, the data that was generated through the tracking uh, tag was something that NewsRight itself could monetize. And so it would make its, basically it would be making its money through uh, providing information about news usage, obviously, um, you, know, uh, you know, anonymously. You're not going to say what, what you've been looking at or what you've been looking at, but in general how people are utilizing news content. Um, uh, sell that data um, as the way of, of generating revenue for the organization. Um, that's not to say that that's necessarily the best model. Uh, it was just it was how that particular one was put together. Uh, and actually, I'm, I think they've moved off of that. I'm not really sure exactly how they've structured it at this point. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I I think they're I think they are starting to charge some sort of subscription structure. I ha um, but I'm not entirely sure how they've how they've changed it since I'm no longer really working with them. Uh, perhaps I can um, answer the question with a uh, with a question um, because I'm ignorant um, in, in this sphere and clearly not a not a rights holder in any respect. But uh, I'd like to find out more from the IPTC and and other parallel um, efforts what is being done about trying to educate the public um, and therefore um, many of the eighty percent of uh, of infringers um, about who owns rights why rights um, respect is important, um, where the point of um, use fits within the, the life cycle of a, of a piece of content. And I think only then um, can you properly ascertain what the price point should be for involvement um, in um, accessing you know, that, that reference uh, data. 
So uh, perhaps during the rest of the conference, I would like to hear a little bit more about um, how IPTC and, and others um, wish to describe some of the technical realities to both um, uh, you know, reputable users and also infringers. Let me actually add, although I'm not really part of the panel, let me add one, uh, one response to your question as well, because I've asked the same question of a few uh, friends of mine, um, individual freelance photographers, and uh, um, I asked them specifically, not so much um, with respect to some organized um, registry, but rather about RightsML, the work that we're doing here um, at the IPTC. And they all, in some form or another, said that they are hoping and looking towards the, the software providers of their organization software, anything from Aperture and, and Adobe uh, to Photoware's uh, suite of systems uh, or, or Photomechanicus is widely used by individual photographers. They're looking to those uh, software providers to hopefully help them encode what then ultimately becomes a RightsML snippet. They say, we, we can't type this in even if you give us a field, but if you give me a way to click together a few expressions or if there are a few standard bundles that I can select and apply to my uh, image and then send it out. Um, and in general, the response was that they would be willing to pay for that in terms of, well, uh, you know, an upgrade license or a new license to whatever software that is. But they're looking to to the evolution of their software of choice to provide this. Just like CC, right? Creative. Similar. I mean, CC is also a way of, of allowing you, you know, prepared bundles and then right. just express that. Right. Um, so purely anecdotal, but uh, that is what some individual photographers said to that part. We have about five to ten more minutes. Um, if there are further questions, I see one. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, just to the panel, um, Roger Bacon, Reuters. Um, I'm interested in where you see the moral responsibility lying, and I'm interested in seeing where you see a solution or who you're looking to for a solution to such a broad church uh, for so many different rights issues. And George, you're a lawyer, and you're free, so it's unusual to take that opportunity to ask questions. <laughs> well, that's why you're getting so many at the moment. To everyone, I, I like the idea of the software. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand the, 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 the moral question. Perhaps as a lawyer I'm morally challenged. Um, uh, um, you know, certainly I think that it is incumbent upon rights owners to clearly express uh, the rights that, they, that, that travel with their content. At the same time, however, it's also important for um, people who access content and utilize that content to recognize that there is a, um, a fundamental footing of laws that uh, protect um, the rights of copyright holders. And that the fact that I don't go out and say I own the copyright on this or that you can't use it to uh, you know, post on your wall or, or what have you, um, is not necessary for me to do uh, as a copyright holder. In the United States, copyright law is, is a strict liability um, law, which means that you don't have to know that I own a copyright in the item that you've taken or know that you are, in fact, violating my rights to be guilty of copyright infringement. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it is incumbent upon, well, I think it do, is incumbent upon rights owners to express those rights simply to further the understanding of um, and, and to attempt to prevent misunderstanding of how content can be used. Uh, I do think that, that content users also have an obligation to understand the legal framework in which they operate when they take a piece of content. I think it, I'll go beyond the amoral lawyer. Uh, I think you have to come to a basic understanding that Ultimately, the rights holder creator uh, is entitled to some level of fair compensation from the ongoing income stream that's created from the fruit of their work. And so uh, in, in the U.S., I've said for the last few years at least, it seems that everyone has figured out how to make money off of photographs except for photographers. And, and if you look at the number of businesses that are built 
on the premise of exhibition, distribution, display uh, of images, and yet none of the revenue created by those streams finds its way uh, to the original rights holder, uh, you know, some of that is uh, admittedly is due to uh, the failings of the rights holder community to come up with a system to facilitate that. But at the same time, uh, there's very little effort or acknowledgement from the uh, user side in, in those uh, business models to uh, provide any compensation. And what's what we see coming down the line now is, uh, is in particular in relation to orphan works legislation and, and how that relates to the use of images and compensation is that there seems to be a, a significant emphasis in the coming year or two on an expansion of fair use in the U.S. to the extent that fair use is becoming a right rather than an affirmative defense. And we've heard that offered in, in a number of symposia recently, uh, uh, one at the Library of Congress by uh, Professor Yazzie from, uh, I, know, I guess he's with American University, who's, who's considered to be the kind of founder of Orphan Works. Uh, he seems to be proposing an expansion of uh, that fair use doctrine. And in a number of the comments recently submitted to the Copyright Office by libraries and universities, they've come to the point of saying we actually don't need orphan works legislation going forward because we can simply expand fair use. But again, I think it all goes back to coming to that basic understanding that somehow or another, if, if, if in fact creators are going to be able to continue to create, they need to be able to profit in some manner. I'm not, I'm not looking for the entire pie for my photographers. I just want a piece of it. And I just think that they, they should be able to have access to that. And yet, under the, I mean, here you have a, a basis of moral rights. In the US, we have no moral rights. Uh, I'm not, uh, sadly, I'm not particularly uh, hopeful. I would, I would like to wrap it up at this point. Uh, I apologize.